So you see that the mission of the church on earth is clear as far as the owner of the church is concerned. That's why those who gave us the name church said, oh, these are the called out ones from among the world. The called out ones redeemed by the blood of the one that called them to execute the program, the mandate, the will, the purpose of the one that saved them. That's what church. There's nobody, nobody, no living organism on earth that is as special as the church. So the church here is a stopgap project. <laughs> Again, if I use the word stopgap, the church was not just a program to help man, humanity that are falling and God bringing them back. Listen to me. God chose among nations in the world a nation called Israel to be his own. By covenant, by election, by choice, he chose them. But this nation will not go on with God as long as Jehovah the Messiah, or Jesus the Messiah, is not the one they expected. He came, and they said, no, it can't be this one, son of a carpenter, son of Joseph, that we know down the road. No. They were expecting a Messiah that would come majestically in glory. They didn't know that the program for that time is still there. For that, they rejected him. And God said, okay, fine. Since you people are not ready, by covenant, I cannot deny you totally. I cannot leave you eternally. There are still some other people in the world that are not in this category of place to Israel that also needs the blood of my son that I've sent, the Messiah. So let me turn to those ones for now and take care of them as they believe in me until you, Israel, is ready. So the church again on a second fold is a stopgap project when it comes to Israel. The Gentile church we are called. Gentile means those who were not originally there as the commonwealth of Israel. So we became the grafted in people into that covenant of Israel. And that means also, friends, and this may shock you, that this attention given to us now as Gentile church has a time lapse. Hello? Turn to your neighbor and say, the church is not your own. You cannot even have church forever. Mm -hmm. One day, the owner of the church will come and fold up the Gentile church. And it will remain the Israelite church that is waiting. Because they will not just agree. He will allow Satan to deal with them. Until they cry and cry and cry for the Messiah. That is why the second coming, they which are blessed is he that cometh. Because suffer, suffer don't keep. The Antichrist will deal with them, eh? And so the Antichrist is a permitted officer. The Bible says power shall be given him and he shall overcome even the elect. That's why you need to prepare yourself. Gentile church, because our time is folding up, we are having the pressures we are having from the world. Don't kick, say, we are going to do all night. We won't agree, we won't agree. Wait. <laughs> Wait. Get an understanding of your times and be on your toes as much as possible. One thing we will not do is we will not live before our times are. But when it is time, we shall live. If you don't want to live, you shall be left behind. 
Because our time is up. And it's the time of the Antichrist. And because it's his time, he has what you call seizing authority. He will come in, you will pray and pray and pray and pray, your prayer won't work. Whatever he wants to do against those who remain, so will succeed. This is God's eye program. Because this thing we are truly in church, if we don't know what it is, we'll continue. We think it's a social club. We think it's a gathering of a community of a people that are just like themselves. No. No, it's not. Now, have only said this and ladies, and you now know your fivefold ministry is temporary. Your church is temporary. Everything temporary. <laughs> Don't tell him, I said, don't hold on to anything, therefore only hold on to God. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, let me begin to close for today. Listen. Men and women occupying the fivefold ministries, let me start with us to say, because I'm one of them. These offices and officers were created to manage, to grow to train the church to manage to grow and train the people of god that's what our, that is what our work is fivefold ministers and ministries let me ask you you must have read in the book of genesis chapter 2 that when god created the earth there was no vegetation grown at all, physically. Why? Because it has not yet rained. Hmm? But is that the only reason? No. The second reason there is, and there's no man to manage it yet. That's the issue. Because no man to manage it yet, God will not allow those things he has already in his dream created. And he can just do like this and they will show up. But nobody to manage it. So he will not produce it. Do you know that the church will not, and it's not expected to run if there are no fivefold ministries? And every local church should believe God and trust God that God will give them fivefold ministries within the assembly. Because the five is for the perfection of the saints. Fivefold ministry is a necessity to handle the church, the project God has put on earth, to be able to take care of his people that is redeeming and restoring. So it's not an office you occupy for position's sake. Or for aggrandizement or for fame. That's a work. To manage, to grow, and to make sure that you train God's people for the work of ministry. So men and women occupying these offices like me, we must understand that we are on a divine sacred assignment. We're on a divine what? Sacred assignment. These sacred assignments we are in are assignments with laid down standards and rules. Laid down standards and rules. There are certain things by virtue of being called a fivefold minister, I am not permitted to do by heaven. I shouldn't do them. It's not within the standard and the rules of what I should be doing or what I should be, what I should engage in. There is a way God laid it down that I should teach, I should preach, I should deliver the message I deliver, and all of that. My primary focus, first and allegiance, is to God, not to the people. And it's almost automatic that if my allegiance to God is right, definitely I will be doing right towards the people. Even if the people don't like it, they will eventually realize 
that it is true. That is why the Bible will say, to his master, he falleth. To his master, he riseth. That you, congregation, you have no right to be the one to judge him. Because one, you didn't elect him. God set him there. You didn't call him. God called him. Your destiny is only included in his call. So you can't judge him and you shouldn't be the one to pull him down. If he falls, his master will take care of him and make him stand. If he sees that he won't stand, his master will call him home. Let me say this to us. I used to think, quoting the scripture of uh, David, and there is a partial truth in that. I shall not die, but live to declare the works of God. Can somebody put that with me? I shall not die, but live to declare the works of God. It's the scripture. But my understanding has soon improved. That besides work, that work has a time frame to it. As long as there is still time to do it, I can be quoting that psalm and it will be working. But whether I have finished the work or not, and the time is up, pencils up. You are returning back to your master. So church members understand why a pastor is in a hurry. Why a fivefold minister is on it. Because he knows he has. He wants to finish his job within. This exam is for two hours. Answer all questions. And how many questions? My own is 50 questions. Your own is 100. Your own is 150. Within the time frame. Five foot ministry. A very elegant one. But <laughs> master the rules of engagement in it. Very delicate. Very delicate. The standard, the rules, the ethics, the lifestyle of the owner of the church has to be put in place for any fivefold minister to be able to achieve God's dream church under your care. If you don't, you won't achieve it. It is therefore a real privilege for you and I to be called his church dream. It's a real privilege. It's much more a real privilege for you and I to be called to be officers that we serve in that his church. It is much more a real privilege. Not even Jesus Christ, the owner of the church, assumed the leadership of her, of the church, by himself. Do you know that? Jesus had to be called by God to come and be the chief shepherd of the church. He had to be called to be the founder of it. He didn't just assume, I'm one of the trinity. I will be. No. The question was asked, who shall we send and who shall go for us? Some other persons will have raised their hand in heaven. It was a call given to all. Jesus had to be called. When he came here, he did not put that leadership on himself by himself. It was God that put that on him. The same way today, 
you cannot claim to be an officer in God's church if God has not set you. That's why Hebrews 5 4 is clear. No man taketh this honor upon himself except he be called of God. And he gave you the standard. As Aaron was called into the office of a high priest. You remember in the Old Testament, Aaron was called by God. Clearly, we read about that. But there were some other people that called themselves. So Moses passes message to Aaron, and Aaron passes message to them, and one day they say, ah, are you the only one? Ah, we too were a prophet. In fact, I'm a senior prophet. How are you, senior? I have been here doing these imaginations and some. Is, this, is it because I converted from magic to your own? I've been around before you. An argument broke out and the church in the wilderness was divided. Some felt this man is true. Yes, he's the one. The other one says that one. And Moses said, you know what? All of you have a staff of office. Isn't it? We have submitted. And let me take them to God. This your staff is a dry sticko. I will take it to God. And then after the summer days, I will bring them out. Whichever one that begins to bear living leaves and flowers is a dry stick. Whichever one that is alive among them, that's the one God has called. And they all agreed. Yes. Yes. Because you know why they agreed? So many of them claiming that they were called of God had indeed a feeling that they were called. Calling is not by feeling. There are many in the body of Christ today doing ministry by feeling. They stepped in feeling they were called. They have no genuine encounter to say they were called. Dangerous. So they submitted. And after the number of days, this throne was brought out. And what happened? Only that of Aaron's are budded flower. Not only leaf, flower. Oh, it's not only alive, it's beautiful. It's fruitful. It's flowery. Because it's from God. It doesn't matter. It may look like a dry stick. If it's called of God, there is honor in it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And that rested the case. I ask you, pastor, today, pastor in a church, is your rod alive? Are you sure God gave you that rod? If we put it before the presence of God, will he board? Right now, is he boarding? If he's boarding, the shape of a church you have will be different. Remember, this is the same Aaron that allowed them to make golden careful. And this is the complication of the office. If God called Aaron, why is Aaron involved in this? For the fact that you and I are called into the fivefold ministry does not mean that you and I are perfect. It's a privilege given to us. And may we not disappoint heaven. Somebody shout amen. That's why it aches me when I see a minister not doing church. Not even trying to live the Christian life. But for money, for fame, for whatever reason, he's doing what he's doing. This real privilege we have that takes me to read to, for you that Hebrews 5 4, if you read it down to verse 6, you will realize something. <clears throat> Even concerning Jesus, the Bible says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Servant of God, church of Jesus Christ. The church of his dream is never to be pastored or led anyhow. Church of his dream, members of God's church, 
pray and thank God if God has given you the good shepherd. And submit yourself and learn and grow and don't contest the truth that they are preaching to you. There are several other voices speaking around you, even the voice of yourself. Because there are some church members that knows more than the pastor. Hmm? They will analyze your sermon. This one is good. This is not good. This one has no scripture. This one has scripture. Uh, he should have done it this way. He should have done it that way. And then I sit down and ask God. I said, God, didn't you see this man? To have made him the pastor here. Since he knows this much to be my examiner. You know what? He knows in his own eyes. But in the eyes of God, he is not qualified to be here. That's why he's not here. And if he knows that, he will learn. Because at the end of the day, through your learning, you will grow to become. The truth of God's institution called church makes a whole lot of difference when it's well understood. We are stewards of God, men of God. We are helpers of people's joy, even God's people's joy. We are their helpers of their joy. We are the watchers and the oversights of their soul, God's own people. We are called to watch over their souls, not watch over their treasures. I have no business with your money, child of God. It's not my concern. In fact, if I pray for you or prophesy to you and you become a billionaire, your treasure is not mine. It's not my concern. What is my concern is your soul. So if I begin to warn you about your money, it's not your money I'm after. It's your soul. Because when a sheep that grows wool, and you know that a sheep grows wool because the shepherd has fed him well. And so he's producing wool. But the shepherd looks at the sheep because when the wool becomes too much, the sheep cannot see again. The thing covers his eyes. He can't breathe well. He can't walk well. So the shepherd, because he has a concern for his soul, will not wait until that happens. So he will call the sheep from time to time. Just like before the wool becomes cuttable, he does bring the sheep in every evening when they come in and he opens the door and they come in. He calls them one by one. He rubs his hands on them, checks out where there is bud. If there is any bug they have contacted. And then he rubs oil on them, on their, on their wool so that the, the, the bugs cannot stay there. And then he releases them. Come on, go. And then they go in again. Next one. And then this one comes and he says, ah, the wool is covering his eyes. He said, ah. he said come on. This one is good. To, it's ready to be shared. I have to remove and cut some of this wool. Not because I need the money. But for the soul of this. If I leave him, this wool will kill him. And so the shepherd shears the wool, really clots the wool again, the sheep again, feed the sheep, and the sheep is growing on that wool. Now he makes money out of that wool and turns it back into the maintenance of the sheep. I ask church members, when you pay your tithe and give your offering, and you know your pastor does not steal from you, the fine chairs you sit on and the wonderful things you enjoy, where do you think he got the money from? It's the same money you gave. He only, used, he only used it to decorate where you are enjoying. Now you, they eat your own money. <laughs> These are things people don't understand that have caused a lot of problems for people. 
No, it's your soul I'm after. If I'm rebuking you, it's your soul I'm after. Can you imagine Apostle Paul looking at a church member and said, I commit you to Satan to deal with your body that your soul may be saved. Why? Because that guy, they've corrected and corrected and rebuked and rebuked. He won't listen. And Paul loves him so much. He says, it's better you suffer on earth and make heaven. If you have a pastor that is ready to drag you to heaven by force, you better be clapping for that pastor. But today, that's not the kind of pastor congregation want. And I ask, are these the church of Jesus? You could remember that when Jesus preached a hard message, everyone said, this is a hard saying, who will be at this one? And some left. But those who remain, those are his sheep. He said, ah, ah, aren't you people going? He said, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> We're going nowhere, no matter how much we put. Ah, love you, kaka. You, where, where do we go? You have a word of eternal life. What else are we looking for? Ask your neighbor, what are you looking for in church? Eternal word or frivolous word? Which one? Many we call Christians today in the church of God are not looking for eternal word. I close by saying to us all, please, tomorrow is another day. We open another chapter and another sin in this matter. Listen to me. Man fell. Pathetic story. But Jesus came. Amen. Amen. It becomes therefore a disaster. For any man upon whom this salvation of our Lord Jesus has come unto to misuse it. What excuse will you give? You stand there and say, ah, no, Lord, you know I tried. It's not me, it's Adam. It's Adam. Is the Adam in me? Adam in me. <laughs> Listen, Adam has been long fighting for his own solo. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And God says, which Adam? The one in Eden? Ah. <laughs> what about the one I sent to you? The one in Eden, I didn't send him to you. What about the word I sent to you? The one you embraced, you called your Lord and Savior. Why didn't you obey him? What am I saying? We will have no excuse. New Testament church, we will have no excuse. We will have no excuse because God has sent us the real Adam that can save us and he has saved us. Can I hear you, see you lift your hands and say thank you Lord Jesus for coming after my soul. This church thing is a program. It has a time lapse. It will end one day. Can somebody tell me when you think or know the church will end. The day when the sound of the trump shall sound in the air. And those that still remain here amongst the redeemed ones shall be caught up. To meet him in the air. Now when you take away the redeemed from the earth, no more church here. Remember my definition of the church. So stop asking me when will the church end. That is when it will end. But before that day, because we don't know that day, sir. There's another day we don't know. It's called the day of death. The day of what? Death. So either by death or by rapture, we call it. 
That thing we call rapture, that word used, rapture, is not in the Bible. Uh -huh. It's just an English word to describe what will happen when people just <laughs> go up there. But the better word is resurrection. Now listen to me carefully. <laughs> either by death or by that. So either some saints will go ahead. That's why the Bible says, and those that remain. Because some have gone ahead. They went ahead by death transport. Those that remain when the time is up will go up by the resurrection power of God. When we all are gone, is there any church left? I'm asking. No more church. It's so delicate that we don't know the time of this too. For that, we should all now, don't wait till tomorrow, from tonight. If it is to say, okay, this is a new program, this is a new date, from tonight, make up your mind. I am going to chart a new course in this work, in this mission with the church, in this effort of being a Christian. I'm going to make a new job. Because you don't know the time. I don't know the day of my death. God have not told me. And he may not tell me. I don't know the date of the rapture. But he says we should watch out for the signs. Are we seeing signs or we are not seeing signs? Huh? Is it only me seeing signs? How many of you are seeing signs here? <laughs> signs is Boko. If we are to sit down and begin to unveil the ones we have seen, it's too, it's too much, it's overwhelming, you know. The signs are here. The signs are here. And like I always say, that scripture is one thing I try to guide. We use as a guide to say, well, Lord, I don't know the time. But the church should be warned. Something is looming. Something is looming. In two days, he shall raise us up. On the third day, he shall revive us. Do you, have you ever tried to study what that means? When is two days? When is three days? I will always say this everywhere I preach arise. Since the day I studied history, and history tells me that Jesus was likely crucified in AD 32. That day, it dawned on me why many evangelists and preachers will say 2,000 years ago. I said, no, this is an exaggeration. AD 32, if that history date is true, AD 32 till now is not yet 2,000 years. But it's near 2,000 years. 2,000 years will be 2032. Do your maths. And if that date be a true date, and if the scripture says, a day before the Lord is a thousand years here, Can I come down to see you? <laughs> Are you doing mathematics now? A day before the Lord is 1,000 years down here. Let's assume all this is right. Okay? And then in two days, he says, he's going to raise us up. And then I'm giving you history date. And you are seeing when, how close it is. Then I ask you, has God not raised the church in 2,000 years? Yes, he has. The church has been born within the last 2,000 years. The church has been going on. Those that have done well in the church have done well. 
Those that have gone to glory have gone to glory. Pass the baton to so many. In this within 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has been raised. Somebody say church. I'm not talking of denominations, sir. Because within this gathering of people is still the church. Because I don't know you. I don't know what you do. To be candid, I can only be fair to say, oh, we are wonderful people. But God knows each one of us. So the church Jesus is looking for may just be even amongst here. In other words, it may not be all of us here that is the church. Even though we are inside the building. That's why I said, be careful about building. Your name in your membership church, membership list, does not make you a member of the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that Jesus has your name in the Lamb's book of life. So if, two, if within 2,000 years as well, nearing it now, I mean, Jesus has done well. The church has been. The church has done some feet on earth. If you read about God's general, you know God has done some things. We've been raised. And even now with our decadence, God is busy raising us somewhere. Revival is happening in some souls, in some hearts. Is anybody still here? God makes me to understand in Hebrews 11 that his reserves are still there even for such a time like this. So it's not all lost. There's a reason going on. He said in the third day, he's going to revive us. Somebody shout revival. revival. That is the revival you see prophets begin to prophesy that is coming before Jesus appears. In other words, as we enter the 3,000 years, just before we enter or just as we are entering, something will happen. God will bring a revival among his own because their time is up to clarify and to cleanse the bride ready for his coming. And to give many an opportunity at the close of time to see if they will come in. That is the revival of the third day. But that third day will not end, sir, when the trump shall sound in the air. So we don't know when. In all of this, there's no day. But you can see that as we approach even the end of 2,000 years, you can see the signs, you can see the pressure coming from the kingdom of hell. You can see so much how the kingdom of hell is trying to push and push and push and push away. There is no other enemy governments in the world have today than the church. You don't know. <laughs> Everywhere in all nations, Christianity is the enemy. That's the way this is. It's, a, it's an anti-spirit of Christ pushing the church, get away, get away, get away, let me have a free course in this world. Get away. And the church is saying, we are not going anywhere. We are not going anywhere. But are you getting ready? Because you shall surely go. Are you getting ready? Are you getting ready? The church is not getting ready. We want it here. We want it here. Pastor, let Jesus hold it. I still want to marry. Pastor, let Jesus hold it. I still want to go to London. Lord, Pastor, pray that. Pastor, pray, pray, pray that the God will hold it. I still want to give back to children now. Hey, hey, Pastor, no. What he promised me, I'm yet to see it. Ah, please, Pastor, let Jesus not come now. It is not what you want that will determine whether Jesus will come or not. There is a timetable. Somebody shout, there is a timetable. That is why you got to rise up and run like one that knows there is a timetable. I will come your way again tomorrow. Stand with me.